I uh, choose my expeditions in order to learn from our subcontinent's history and also to probe my personal impact on her resources. Um, a few years back, for instance, I walked from, the, from Durban to the Vic Falls along the 19th century, hunt, 19th century hunter trader routes. And uh, I was following the ghost of an ancestor who trekked this route in 1863. He experienced a continent which was wild and raw and beautiful. And we've all but ruined it now. Mm, and his diary as an arch-aristocratic imperialist was very revealing as to the roots of the kind of uh, race relations battles we still face today. Now, much of that walk was on the peripheries of the Kalahari, as you can see. Last year, I went deeper into that great sea of sand, again evoking the memory of a long-dead man. He was a bushman, and he roamed the most arid parts of South Africa, Namibia, and Botswana in the late 1800s, early 1900s. He was a legendary philosopher, felt doctor, teacher, hunter, and his name was Mackay, Mackay Kamkau. Here he is in uh, 1936. And in this photo is also the little boy who would be my guide on this expedition, his grandson, David. When I met David, he was an old man, 76, and easily the most famous bushman in South Africa. And he wanted to be known as a bushman, not a San, which is why I'll call him and his people that throughout this talk. Um, David was the elected traditional leader of the Komani, the last traditional or the last cohesive group of first people that we have left in South Africa. And they speak Afrikaans and Nama. Nama is their first language. He and his family have been photographed throughout their lives. They have been written about throughout their lives. They've starred in adverts and uh, even films like this one with uh, Dolph Lundgren. <laughs> I'm not sure he did himself any favors here. <laughs> However, the principal reason for David Kraper's fame was the land claim which he and his community won in 1999 and which restored just a tiny piece of the land of which they've been robbed in the preceding centuries. They were given 25,000 hectares inside the Kalahari Transontier Park, which was once their home. That's their land in pink in the south. And they were also awarded six farms outside it there in brown. So they live here, about 200 kilometers north of Uppington. So we're talking about this far western corner of South Africa where it borders Namibia and Botswana. I met David when I was wrecking, doing my wreckies for a long walk through the Kalahari. And after we'd got to, to know each other, he said to me, can't you change your quest? You know, the areas in the park north of the land that we were given that I haven't seen in over a century. These are really important heritage sites, our traditional hunting grounds. Please, won't you take me back there with my kids and my grandkids so that I can teach them the stories they need to hear before I die. And so in for a penny, in for a pound. I said, yeah, sure, man, I'll help you. Rushed back home. I couldn't find sponsorship. So I remortgaged my house, got my expedition crew and my film team together, and headed back to the Kalahari late April last year. The Krapers who came along all span three generations, and they're all related to the legendary Mackay. You cannot remember all their names for sure, but just remember the two old men that came to tell us the stories of their youth, Opa David and his brother Buxi. Buxi was in his time the most legendary tracker in the southern Kalahari, and he's to this day a renowned felt doctor. And so, late April last year, a very excited group of people tumbled onto the vehicles and set off for that great expanse of virtual nothingness that is the Kalahari. Setting out on an expedition to invoke the ancestors, to call up the past, the memories, the land, and all its inhabitants. Ooh, 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 ooh. Dawn the next morning brought the kind of sounds I would get very used to in the months to come. <coughs> Waking up in Sputum City. <laughs> You must understand that not only do they live over open fires, but to be a bushman is to smoke. And my heck, are they champion smokers. And if you think there's only tobacco in that roll-up, then uh, you're a gullible goatee. I mean, what tobacco gives you a look like that, I ask you? <laughs> we camped in one exquisite place after another in the ensuing uh, weeks, while we walked to the, old, the places that these two old men wanted to show us. 
the places where, as little boys, they would track Mackay's spoor at a distance until they knew they were too far from home to be sent back, and then learn from him. Learn how to endure great hunger and great thirst as they tracked and, and trapped and hunted. They learned how to make their weapons, how to heal their wounds. They learned how to read animal behavior. They learned how to bury water in, under the sand and ostrich shells. Opa Dava took us to pans of great plenty and pans of utter despair for his ancestors. And he took us to places where Bushmen were punished in years gone by for cardinal sins. They were thrown into thorn bushes and evicted from the area for two big crimes. The first being, you killed more than you could eat. Second crime, you ate your kill before you returned home to share it with your family. Those and many more insights into really a long gone time, I think, when people still had some respect for their natural resources. I'll give you an example. We were in the felt one day when the guys started tracking a cheetah kill. The cheetah ran off and left an ostrich, which the Bushmen said about butchering with great skill and expertise, but they took very little because of their belief that you always leave 80% for the one who does the work. In this case, it was the cheetah. You see, these guys, they don't need a carbon footprint calculator and environmental impact research to know what is ethical, you know, and, and what, is, what is sustainable, really. We spent time wandering in the felt, eating the fruits and tubers that have sustained the Bushmen for centuries, and learning about the medicinal properties of the plants that kept them healthy in the old days. And you soon learn the difference between them and us. You know, we observe a landscape. They are in it. They are of it. And they don't believe that the land belongs to them so much as they belong to the land. It's very hard work digging for those tubers, but they never take more than the plant needs to sustain itself. And always thank it by placing a little coin or a lock of hair in the roots before carefully putting back the soil. Uh, the anti-inflammatory components of this plant, it's a chifbol or a kind of tumbleweed, great for sprains and arthritis as they peel layers off the tuba. I saw them using it later in the expedition on Opar David's knees and it was really very effective. And of course, no plant, no part of any animal, any plant is ever wasted. So it's leaves made for really useful bandages in Opar Buxi's surgery in, in the sun. The little toddlers getting stuck into, you know, bouncing around terrain that would make the average town imam blights, faint. I mean, it's full of scorpions and, and uh, snakes and spiders and stuff. But um, even for outsiders like me, you know, eventually your view of this land changes from a kind of forbidding terra incognito into a bountiful provider of food and food and shelter, um, even, even water in small quantities in the melons and the, uh, the cucumbers. And of course the Bushmen of old knew very lesson, well the lessons we're trying to relearn. Lessons like eat fresh food, eat local food, eat seasonal food. Um, and they are masters of slow food, communally prepared and communally consumed. I'm sure it's a function of poverty as much as culture, but not one scrap of food is ever wasted, and you eat when you are hungry. I mean, really hungry. You eat to live. You don't live to eat. And I think that's a very useful lesson for us. I think we have elevated food to the most ridiculous status in our society, and it's dangerous because of the consumption that it encourages. How many more chef competitions and cooking channels and recipe books do we need, for heaven's sake? Uh, they also taught us to be extremely cautious in our water consumption. We were going through four to six liters per person per day. That's for everything, eh? Drinking, cooking, washing plates, clothes, yourselves. And it's enough, if you're careful. Uh, when we went hunting, or rather when they went hunting, the men would change into their ties, their skins, their traditional gear, and set off across the dunes to try and get supper. Um, they weren't successful this time, I'm afraid, not even raiding a sociable weaver's nest in the hope of some snake for supper. So because they're dressed as of old, and while we watch them, let's chat about this question of what is a real bushman. People keep saying to me, but you know, were they, were they proper bushmen, the real thing who hunt with bows and arrows and wear skins? 
And yeah, of course, they're the real thing, but it's got nothing to do with what they wear and where they live, and it's got everything to do with what they know and what they believe. It is so curious, isn't it, that we're quite happy to accept that a real Zulu holds high office in the union buildings, or a real Kosa can be an IT geek, but we want to freeze the Bushmen in time. We want to trap them in our notion of who or what they should be, sort of deny them their identity if they adopt any aspects of other cultures, which they've done since time immemorial, by the way. I wonder if it isn't guilt, because I think we know what we did to them. And also, perhaps a deep-seated longing, because I think in a very deep part of us, we know that when we lost the kind of connection with wilderness that these people still have, we lost an extremely important part of us. So these are Bushmen, okay, even though they use mirrors and wear Western clothes, sometimes to deliberate comical effect. And they are still Bushmen when the youngsters climb trees, not necessarily to scan the plains for game, but to try and get cell phone signal. <laughs> I was so devastated when I saw that. Anyhow, what else did I learn from them? I learned about paying attention. These guys are fully present all the time. They're watching and they're listening. Changes in the clouds and the wind. Alarm calls from the bush. They're... Um, watching your facial expressions, your body language, they are fully present. We rush too much to do that. And um, they are also, oh no, hang on, sorry, go back, go back, go back, go back. Um, so they pay attention. Obviously, they had to learn to do so because their survival depended on it. But because they pay attention, they have the most incredible memory and also a kind of inbuilt GPS. We were out there and I said, yeah, wouldn't it be fantastic if you could find just one thing that Makai used in his life, just one thing that his hands held. And then old man Buxy piped up. He said, you know, when I was a child, I saw Makai burying ostrich shells in the sand under a tree for times of drought when they were on the move. I saw them again when I was in my 20s. Please give me a chance to find that tree. I know it was 50 years ago, but I want to try and find that tree. And blow me in that enormous expanse of nothingness because he found that tree. The door lamp on us, who was on my leaf. It was my opa, as I can believe, he needed a door lamp. It's full from that deep, deep in the air. It's like you said, I'm full of art here, and I'm full deep in the wood stain. You know, stain with it there. The wolf come, I I permit her to be a That's my body art here, I'm so ashamed. I'm not going to say, I'm full of body art here, my, my brother. That's my seer, that's the need of me. I'm so, my, my upper down, I'm going to create seer. That's the pain of being separated from the land of your birth and your memory, and we must never underestimate it as a driver of political discourse in our country. It's also a pain which I had underestimated in its effects on the crepers. The pain manifests in huge social trauma and bad, bad alcoholism. And we had a very hairy time in the first few weeks with guys smuggling the booze in and there was fighting and heaven knows what else. Eventually we were too far from civilization for them to get hold of it and things calmed down a lot. And I really think they got to know a kind of peace that they haven't known for a very long time. So why do the crepers drink to excess? Well, because if we take a look at this family and this people, we see more pain than it is possible for the human psyche to bear. And it has lasted for centuries. The Kamani have been tested, they have the genes that show them to be directly related to the first people who had our continent to themselves for 25,000 years until the arrival of the Khoi Khoi people, after them waves of the Zulu and Xhosa ancestors, and eventually the Europeans in the 1600s when things just started to go from bad to worse. Makai's grandparents started retreating into the Great Kalahari for fear of being hunted like game apart from other abuses. Believe it or not, you could buy a permit to hunt a bushman in South Africa until 1927, and in Namibia until 1937. Then the Kalahari refuge was uh, taken over by colored immigrants from the Cape. Mackay fled to Namibia, found himself caught up in the German occupation of that country, and a genocide between 1904 and 1908, in which 80% of the Herero population and 50% of the Namas were annihilated. He fled back to the Kalahari Transfrontier Park, 
but it was declared a park in 1930, and the, so the Bushmen were evicted. Over many decades, the Crapers were the last to go in 1975. They were forced to squat on the side of the road into the park, literally, until they found work as itinerant laborers in various farms in the three countries around there, until the land claim in 1999. The land claim, though, has been a complete mess. There were 80 original claimants. The government insisted the numbers should be swelled to 300. All manner of people were brought in. Many of them didn't have a single drop of Bushman blood in them. They took over the, pro over the process, stole millions of rands worth of money and assets from the original claimants. Uh, 13 years after the land claim, the Crapers have no houses. They have no clean drinking water. They have no electricity. They have, what they have in abundance actually is complete indifference from local and national, national government. And I think there's a very useful way of summarizing what's happened to this family in the next three photos. This is uh, David's grandfather on his mother's side, Akharov Kalakap. There he is in the 1940s, lord of the desert and all he surveys. Akharov in the 1960s, his face beginning to become lined and drawn, his body begins to shrivel, until in the 1990s, he's turned into a pathetic shadow of the great hero he once was. This has happened in our lifetimes, on our watch. Shame on us all. By the end of the expedition, I can tell you we were definitely friends for life, and my work for the Komani continues, principally by means of a trust which I've formed for heritage preservation, to be funded, I hope, by donations, but certainly from um, funds from a book which I'm currently writing about our adventure. My old mentor, my inspiration, my dear friend, David Craper, died two months ago, so he won't be able to guide this process. His funeral was a farce and an insult to his memory, organized and paid for by the very government agencies that had neglected him and his people for so long. The final travesty was that he was buried in a brick and cement grave, so his body will never be fully returned to the Kalahari Sands as he always wanted it to be. How different from his beloved Makai's grave, which we visited last year at the end of our trip. No marble tombstone, no epigraph. How fitting for a man who walked so lightly on the earth. When we parted last year, Bixie had made me this little talisman to keep me safe. He said, look, I gave it long legs like yours, but I put a little bushman on his shoulder just to remember us by. <laughs> Or as if I need reminding, I'm always going to have a bushman on my shoulder for the rest of my life, and I hope I can live long enough and work hard enough to see this family and this people take up their rightful places as the first citizens of our country. With so much to teach us about where we came from, and I think where we should be going. Thank you so much for listening to me.